All right, I'd say we're just going to go ahead and start. Um, all right, everybody, thank you so much uh, for joining us in this breakout session. Um, today, we will be discussing the application process um, more in depth with Mr. Sean Addy. And uh, before we get to you, Sean, I'd like to give uh, Brittany an, an opportunity to introduce herself. I'll introduce myself and then we'll pass over to you. Go ahead, Brittany. Good afternoon. My name is Brittany Williams, and I am a senior policy analyst on the higher education and policy team with the Education Trust National Office. And I am excited about this conversation that will take place today. Thanks for join, joining us. All right. Thank you so much for that, Brittany. And real quickly, my name is Patrick Rodriguez. I'm a Justice Fellow here at the Education Trust, located out of Atlanta, Georgia. Also formerly incarcerated, released in December of 2019. So I think it's been somewhere around 17 months now. I'm super excited to uh, talk with Sean Addy. Um, so I'll briefly, um, Sean Addy is the, um, he is the Director for Correctional Education uh, for the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and he is here with us today. I'm going to pass it over to you, Sean, and just kind of lead with what's going on. Sure, that sounds great. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Yeah, good morning. Um, depending on where you uh, where you're joining us from. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit more about the reinstatement of Pell and talk about the application process as outlined in the act which passed at the end of December 2020. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, the the act passed passed in June of or June in December of 2020. And in the act, it said the department had to implement the full restoration of Pell for incarcerated individuals uh, by July 1st, 2023. In June of 2021, uh, the department held public hearing sessions on potential issues for regulation. And one of the topics covered was the restoration of Pell grants for people in prison and the, the, the bill that was passed at the end of December. Um, the department announced that we do intend um, to regulate on uh, the reinstatement of Pell. And really the purpose of regulation is for us to get more input from the community, um, to, to clarify uh, what's written in the bill, uh, and, and to really help us provide more clarification to the people who will be um, using the bell on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, correctional educators, uh, people in prison, um, you know, reentry organizations. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about in a little bit more detail, as I mentioned, is the application process. And I'm going to specifically talk about uh, the portions of the act which pertain to uh, evaluation, reporting, and technical assistance. And those are important because anyone um, who's going to be administering a prison education program under the Act will have to be aware of those requirements and uh, seek to comply with them. And as I mentioned, regulation hap is going to be happening, so we'll have more information down the road in terms of clarifying uh, what all is contained in these. Um, but the first piece that's covered in the Act is evaluation. So beginning no later than one year after the act was passed. So this December 28th, 2021, uh, the Department of Education is going to be awarding a contract for to an organization to conduct an ex external evaluations on prison education programs. And so this evaluation is going to look at incarcerated people accessing the FAFSA. It's going to look at outcomes for students, both uh, incarcerated as well as after release. It's going to, such as uh, post-secondary post -secondary degree attainment, um, waiting lists for prison education programs, people continuing their education after they're released from incarceration, uh, employment and earnings outcomes, um, and, and other factors as well. Uh, this evaluation is also going to be tracking people who get Pell Grants, um, looking at kind of one, three, and five years after release um, for those outcomes. It's also going to see what institutions are providing reentry or career services to students as part of their programs, as well as the efficacy of those services. You know, we heard in the previous panel how important those reentry and career services are for students as they're nearing release, as they're coming out. And so it's going to be looking at that. Um, in concert with that evaluation, um, 
there's also going to be each each institution of higher education that's operating a prison education program under the program has to submit a report to the secretary, um, including that information. So there'll be an evaluation and then uh, programs that are participating will have to include that information. The second component for that's useful to know for the application process is there's a reporting component that's uh, a piece of the bill. So no later than one year after the enactment of the act. So one year for that, you know, absolute latest, as I mentioned, the act has to be enacted by July 1st, 2023. So the latest this could be would be July 1st, 2024. Um, the department has to put out a report on an annual basis. And that report is going to be looking at, you know, who are the institutions who are offering prison education programs? How many people are getting Pell Grants? in those institutions, those educational institutions. Um, what are the demographics of the people? We heard earlier uh, you know, in that discussion about equity and looking to see who, what students were actually participating in the program. And so part of this report will contain, will, will be uh, demographics for confined or incarcerated people. Um, how much it's costing for students to attend you know, students have a cap for a Pell Grant. And so I think it'll be important to see what programs are charging and, and what kind of um, financial aid students, especially, you know, Pell Grants that students will still have available. Uh, we're going to be looking in this report at the mode of instruction. So obviously due to the COVID pandemic, a lot of educational institutions switched to, to distance or using tablets or some kind of, you know, correspondence course, but looking to see what mode of instruction these programs are, are operating for, are operating, um, looking at academic outcomes for student, looking at, for students, looking at post-release outcomes, um, continued post-secondary enrollment, credit transfer, job placement, um, looking to see if students are transferring between prison education programs, what kind of programs are commonly being offered by all of these institutions that are participating in the program. Um, instructor turnover is something we'll be looking at as as well as sort of some general findings regarding best practices for uh, instituting prison education programs. Uh, and then finally, there's going to be a technical assistance report, a technical assistance piece to the uh, to the project. And I think this is important because there are a lot of existing programs that are providing prison education, but there's also going to be new programs. And there's also going to be programs who may not be using Pell Grant funding, who may be operating off of private funding. And so sort of walking people through the hoops of, of what it means to, you know, as we heard earlier again, you know, how to access the FAFSA, you know, how to fill out a FAFSA, things you need to think about. Um, so there's going, to, there's going to be a technical assistance uh, component for this project as well. Um, and that's something where uh, the Department of Education will be working with the Department of Justice. Um, Department of Justice obviously is jurisdiction of the Bureau of Prisons, um, which is uh, one of the places this, these programs will be offering. And so really we're going to be providing technical assistance to help these programs to make sure they're delivering high quality education, um, to make sure that, that students are succeeding and that you know, these, these programs are uh, effective. So that really quick is the, as of right now, um, as I mentioned, you know, regulation is going to be happening, but that is the uh, things to know about for the application, you know, when you're thinking about the application process to participate in the program. Okay, well, thank you so much for that, Sean. Um, that was a lot, but I think that you definitely went over a few things that are, that are pretty interesting to me specifically. Um, and so, um, that is that kind of that time frame between now and 2023. Um, do you feel, um, I know that there's a very big movement for individuals to push for um, Pell Grant to get reinstated as quickly as possible, um, but do you feel like the step wedge design actually supports um, the Department of Education in terms of maybe going about um, Pell Grant implementation in the correct way? So do I think, it's a, it's a little bit of a tough question, but do you think that the the pause of like not getting it enacted immediately will, can act as a benefit is, is kind of what I'm asking. Hmm. That's a good, I mean, that's a great question because the, the easy answer is yes, but what about people 
who are who are in prison right now and not in who are, and aren't doing anything and are eligible and want to enroll in post-secondary education. Um, so it really is a balancing act of you know you know yes but not yet. It's 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 easy for me to say that here at the department. You know when I'm not thinking how am I going to get a job when I get out of prison. You know or how am I going to you know start from scratch with education on top of everything else. Um, while incarcerated. But I, I think, again, as I said, it's, it's easy for me to say this without having to, to live it. I think for the long term benefit of the program, I mean, when we think about Pell being gone for 26 years functionally, I think when we, when we, when we talk about the long term benefit of the program, and, and not, not even the benefit of the program, the benefit of the students, it's having, you know, potentially guardrails. It's having quality programs that students can choose from to enroll, you know, so that they're going in and they're getting 45 credits or 60 credits towards a, towards a BA or getting an AA. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think in, in the long term, um, just in terms of with the long term view, I, I think, you know, good, good things take time. Um, I, I think there could be a concern that if, if we did rush things, um, then you, you, you know, there, there could be program quality concerns that arise. Um, mm -hmm. you know, this was, it was a bipartisan bill that was passed, but it, I think it's still, you know, it, it behooves us to, to be thoughtful, you know, yeah. in our approach to implementation, I think, and also to listen to as many stakeholders as possible. You know, I mentioned earlier, the importance of subject matter experts, you know, so it's really, it's talking to formerly incarcerated people who participated in college and prison programs and getting their insight, you know, what worked, what didn't, what can we do? And I think also, and I'm kind of really going long winded here. Um, you know, if we take a little bit more time, you know, we, we see things with the COVID pandemic, perhaps there's, there's more we can do to get technology inside of prison and not technology to replace, but technology to supplement. You know, so that instead of using a 25 year old desktop, you're using a tablet that in three years when you come out is not ancient technology and you still know how to operate. It. So I, I think there, you know, that's a potential benefit. Yeah, and I think, um, well, and I think it's so great that we're having this conversation as well as I was incarcerated and I did do prison education and I did take a course and all of those things. So, um, but, but as I think about my current positions that I hold in Georgia and our landscape here specifically, um, and how we actually get uh, more more universities involved. Because why would the university want to get involved just because Pell Grants are available? I think in 94, statistics were kicked out. And it was only 1% of, of Pell Grant dollars that were actually being utilized by the incarcerated population. So I would argue that is deservable, um, right? <laughs> no matter how egregious the crime might be, the access to the 1% of the overarching um, budget. But like when we talk to universities, universities are sometimes hesitant. Um, they're hesitant because of the responsibility that comes with educating um, an incarcerated person. And so kind of not wanting to be fully vested in which we talk about, which is that preparatory portion of it, because we know the average reading age is, I believe it's eighth grade. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of individuals who are incarcerated may not actually have high school diplomas and things of that nature. And so you have that pre-college, college, and then you have that re-entry portion. And so the university is an institution within itself that has uh, almost unlimited resources at times, um, yet not necessarily wanting to um, go full force to educate these people who are incarcerated um, because of maybe how it might look. Um, and so I was just curious as, as to what you might think of that statement there. Um, so, so one minor quibble with what you said. So it wasn't 1%. It was it was point one. Oh, point one. Okay. So it was, even, yeah, it was, it was an, an even smaller. Yeah. It's, it's a minuscule amount. Absolutely. Of things. Um, and also, uh, I mean, it's it's also something where if you, when you come out of prison, you're eligible for a Pell Grant. You know, how, how is that different? You know, in terms of, you know, anyways. Um, so how do we, how do we get educational institutions invested? Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, there's no, there's no, I mean, there's a lot of institutions, first of all, that are interested. You know, when we did the first round of Second Chance Pell, we had 
200 plus institutions apply across the country. Mm -hmm. um, when we did the second round of Second Chance Bell, we had, I want to say almost 200 institutions apply to participate. So the, the demand, the demand is there, I think, and, and two and four year institutions. Um, I think probably, um, you know, as you mentioned, you touched a little bit about the kind of the pre-college piece. Right. I think, I think that's sort of an, that's a really important piece. If we're talking about sort of long-term Pell being here, we need to create sustainable, again, high quality pathways to create, you know, to create a, um, you know, an, an educational pathway for someone who, um, you know, a lot of times we talk about sort of second chances and, and it's even second chance Pell, but a lot of people didn't have a, a first chance, you know, but we create an educational pathway so people have that sort of second chance or second bite um, at the apple to, to get that high school diploma and then to, to pursue post-secondary education. Um, and then I, th I think it's also, it, it, it's, it behooves not just, I mean, advocates have been doing the work for so long. It also behooves, I think, the department to do more in terms of messaging, in terms of outreach, mm -hmm. to let places know this is something that's available. This is, you know, something that that is good for everyone. Um, so I, I think it's, that's what I would say. Is okay. that answer? Yeah, I, yeah, you have I more questions. A couple of my questions might be a little bit far reaching, um, but and but that's okay, right? It's just to kind of get us thinking, right? Um, and I kind of want to take it back to the topic of the room, um, application process. And so, application process is is kind of pointed, and it means exactly that: the application process. Um, and so, I would I would wonder, um, are is is the Department of Education kind of thinking about how it can be more inclusionary? of individuals who might be excluded from programming, either based on their crime or their sentence duration. Um, and would they be able to access the prison education courses? And I know that um, one thing that was, a, that was a hot topic during the implementation of, of, of Pell Grant was allowing lifers um, to be able to access it. And, I'm, and they are, which is a good thing. But I think that specific states have specific mandates uh, to minimize the individuals that can apply for those things. And so I was wondering if there was any kind of thoughts in that area. So, I mean, I, I think the department would, and that, I think that would be part of our messaging that, you know, when, when Pell was restored, it was a clean lift, you know, yeah. any, anyone who, and I think that would really sort of fall under our, the technical assistance piece as, as people are looking to, implement programs or improve their existing programs, you know, that technical assistance piece, I think is crucial just to remind, um, to remind states and to remind, or to remind departments of correction, as well as uh, institutions of higher education, that everyone is eligible, you know, and it's something that, that they need to be cognizant of when they're thinking about their, uh, sort of their admissions process for for people to participate in post-secondary education, um, you know, as long as as long as you can get in the program, you should be able to eligible. You should be eligible for it. You should be able to enroll. Okay. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I I, um, I guess I just I, I I've run into so many people while I was incarcerated that just couldn't be a part of the programs that I was a part of because I was like a non-violent offender, and a lot of people want to exclude. Um, violent offenders. I know that there's always those um, those carve outs. But the good thing, like you said, is that we're going to be able to make that argument is this was a clean lift. Um, and with that clean lift, that should allow everybody to be able to access it. Um, of course, there's there's minimal space, right? Um, just in design. So there's not going to be like an influx of like 50 million people getting education while they're incarcerated because there's only two classrooms available in an actual prison system. And so that goes to beg the difference as to like structuring and structural questions on on redesigning of prison systems, if they're going to continue to be here, then we should probably build them to be a little bit more accessible for people to get educated, right? But we're not going to go down that rabbit hole there, and we're going to stick with the, stick with the application process um, portion. And so we have, so we have the application process inside of the prison system, which would be what we just talked about. But what about the application process to the universities when individuals are released from prison? 
So what I, what I mean specifically is like I see, I feel like sometimes individuals who are accepted into prison education programs still have to reapply in the same manner that they would have had they not participated um, in a prison education course. And that is navigating um, the box, which has them going to an, an explanatory and elaborate explanation of the crimes that they had committed. And so I'm not sure because I didn't look at the bill specifically, but would there be provisions specifically stating um, that if your students do participate in your prison education course, then they should be allowed to continue on campus as well? So that's not a piece of the bill. Um, you know, the bill was, was really looking closely at in-prison programs. Mm -hmm. But I, it's something, you know, I, again, I mentioned the technical assistance piece. I think it's something um, that that we would that we would look to you know address you know we we heard about equity earlier today you know and equity sort of undergirds every all of this but I think it's something that we would look to address with with uh, the technical assistance piece you know make sure that you're you're practicing what you preach you know if you're operating in a, you know a program inside of a prison you know there should be a pathway. For your students when they come out to continue being your students you know it's it's no different than transferring from you know unc greensboro to unc chapel hill you know i mean now you're well you're in georgia so i'm not sure what the what the comparison would be but you on that you understand the uh yeah the georgia perimeter uh, to georgia state <laughs> yes yes so yeah. I mean, that, that's what it, you're you're just moving from one campus in a specific area to another campus in a specific area. People transfers all the people transfer all the time. It shouldn't be hard. Um, and, I, and I think at the same time, if we're encouraging that, we also need to be cognizant that that doesn't result in schools screening out people as well. Okay. We're saying, okay, you should only accept, you know, or not you should only accept students, but your students who are students here in this prison should be your students in the community. We want to make sure that then they say, okay, well, we're only going to accept students that we know will take in the community right now. You know, we don't want a narrowing. We want, I think, a broadening. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And th thank you for your responses. Um, Brittany, did you have any questions you would like to ask, Sean? Yes, so I do have a question, and this is um, specifically for those of us who may want to um, follow any updates that may come from um, Pell restoration. Are there any resources that we can maybe access directly from the department that would um, keep us abreast of any updates or you know any changes or, or any messaging that we can give to our audiences or our stakeholders across the states that we are serving them? So that's a great question. And I was I was I was thinking about this yesterday as I was as I was preparing and thinking how we need some kind of inbox, some kind of, you know, as informational updates come out to make sure that we're sharing them with stakeholders. Um, so the short answer is, I, I don't think we have sort of a unified or one central place. You know, you know, so for example, we use our federal register when we put out notices. Um, you know, we have, you know, the secretary's Twitter account will send things out. We have, you know, press releases from our, uh, or communications people, but I don't think there's one place that's sort of a one-stop shop when it comes to, at least as the department approaches things, um, for a second chance, Pell. But that's, uh, that's a great flag, and it's something that I think we can work on internally and, and, and find a, a, a good way to disseminate information to people. Thank you. I think that that would be helpful. Um, and so um, my next question, and we're coming to the end of our session, but I want to ask, are there going to be any additional opportunities for advocacy um, for stakeholders across the states to maybe um, reach out and, and maybe give some of their opinions or some, some maybe best practices just sharing information with the department, would there be another opportunity um, to, for, for our stakeholders to speak? So the, the one thing that I'm aware of right now, I mentioned it earlier, is the um, negotiated rulemaking sessions that are going on. Um, 
Let me see if I can pull up a quick link um, to drop in the chat for how people can find out more about um, becoming involved in that. But that that would be that would be the one the the main place that people could um, provide input or feedback on on restoration of Pell. You know, as we as we look to. Uh, and while you are pulling that link, this is just a flag for our participants um, here that um, Ed Trust has already provided um, comments and uh, made a statement, and those comments are still publicly available. Um, you can find a link to that information on Ed Trust website, um, as well as previous uh, Negri documents. That's correct. Um. Yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not finding that link, but um, I can. I can follow up with that. But that that would be um, a potential opportunity as the department looks to to do negotiated rulemaking. That sounds good. Um, okay. Well, hello everybody. We're winding down, and just in recap, um, Sean has been so gracious to go over the steps the Department of Education are taking um, to not just see the ban the box or not the ban the box. We not just see Pell Grant implemented but understanding really what that means. Um, and they'll be doing a survey, they'll be uh, surveying both um, both universities and you know, just the collectiveness of stakeholders to really understand what's gonna happen over the next course of the next two years um, before 2023. Um, and so it's just really exciting to actually be in conversation with you, Sean, um, and to know where your passion is firsthand and how the way that you're able to navigate some of the, I threw a couple of tough questions at you, but you bounced right back, you know, and I think that that's amazing. Um, and so I'm very excited for what's coming and what is inevitable at this point with what has been signed. Um, did you have any final thoughts before we allow our guests to continue? Uh, no, just, you know, thank you for the time and, and glad to share a little bit about what the department's doing. Um, and thank you to, to everyone who's here because I think you're doing um, what I would say the real work, you know, the on the, on the ground work. You know, I think it's, it's easy at the department to sit in an office and send emails and, and talk on a video chat. But I think, you know, I really appreciate everyone who's also responsible for Pell being back, too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, we are, we're fighting. We're doing what we need to do, um, you know, and I think that there's a, there's a role for all of us to play. And so we appreciate you just as you appreciate us. And I think that that's, that's important to be said. Um, and so everybody, my name is Patrick Rodriguez, and this is Brittany Williams. And we had Sean Addy for the past 30 minutes. I believe it's time for you guys all to exit and to go off into the, into the panels and choose the route uh, that you'll choose to go on. So everybody have a great, uh, great afternoon. And we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, bye, everyone.